Why natural gas propulsion? We're more than just engines, but we have engines across a wide variety of power band from the fairly small to quite large engines, two strokes, four strokes, and a wide variety of, of different sizes. So we power the very largest cruise ships as well as some much smaller working vessels that you might see in the harbor areas. We also have the complete wet end of everything as well and the controls on the bridge in between. Large controllable pitch, fixed pitch propellers, nozzles, rudders, steerable thrusters, and jets. We also recently put together a ship design, several hundred professionals in that area, and we have a big group in environmental management. Enough about what Silla's breadth. Let's take a quick look at the what, why, and how, and why we have a big marine gas market in front of us. People don't recognize how large it is. We'll talk about the drivers behind this and the why. We'll take a look at how things can be done uh, and the experience we have and some conclusions. The marine market. These are the energy trends that you can see from the EIA. But basically up here we have the energy consumption. See renewables, biofuels are very small, liquids, natural gas, nuclear, and coal. But there's moderate energy demand growth and greater use of renewables. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a picture of talking about the liquid fuel supply themselves. You can see biofuels begin to take on a bigger part of the picture. Petroleum, the next one below, below, and natural gas will take a more significant role. But the fuel imports will be declining as the electric and gas vehicles grow and biofuels tend to expand. Lastly, you can see down here the natural gas supply, if you look at that piece alone, that shale gas in orange is going to grow dramatically over the next couple of decades going out because this will offset the other gas declines across some more conventional and other non-associated gas supplies that are available. Shale gas, liquid fuel shrinkage, and moderate growth. Where's all this natural gas? Everything in pink or orange is located uh, natural gas. You see we've circled the major plays in the North America. All the white, as we know, are the population where all the demand for energy is. So there's a lot of overlap here between the natural gas available and where the demand needs to be. In the U.S., we now have a natural gas shale boom with Marcellus, Fayetteville, Woodford, Haynesville, and Barnett gas plays. For example, the Marcellus field alone of natural gas can replace all coal, petroleum, natural gas today, hydro, wind, and solar power, and encompass all the world's energy needs for two full years, that one field. So it's an enormous amount of gas, and we also have it in several other locations. So we have today a huge surge in gas going out for a, more than a couple centuries by many estimates. Let's take a look at the why on the drivers behind the regulations, some of the carbon footprint, and other concerns that are beginning to push more and more towards gas. It all comes down beginning with the penguins, its emissions, and our health. And these things are all being controlled more and more now by the EPA as well as the IMO. But those elements are why we're beginning to see more and more push towards clean, available, and safe natural gas. In the U.S., everything you see here in red is non-compliant to the EPA air standards. That's all of our major ports, all of our major population centers, and all the major manufacturing centers virtually throughout the U.S. Anything that's a range or a grassland is doing much better. But obviously, the worst case is found and all of our major, major ports. So there's really five game changers here going on. We just talked about shale being a tremendous change in availability of energy for the United States. And on the lower right hand corner you can see because of the abundance of gas and rather modest demand, prices are dampened and will begin dampened. They broke the six to one ratio between the price of oil and the price of gas. In the past, if gas was at 4 or $5 per million BTU, the 6 to 1 ratio meant that fuel would be at 
six times that, or $24 to $30 a barrel. Where is gas today? Four to five. Where is oil? Approaching 100, plus or minus. That ratio is now broken. So gas is available. And if you look at the future, strips is available at $6 range for many years out. So it's a bargain. Three things from the lower left to upper right are controlled by the EPA as mandates. One, the sulfur quantities. The global standard you can see in 04, 12, and 2020 goes from 4.5 to a half a percent. Well, the ECA, the next column over, you can see is a much tighter standard, much faster being approached. We we're already at 1% within the ECA in 2010. 2015, it goes to one-tenth of a percent. We saw earlier the geographic encapsulation with the ECA 200 miles offshore. And lastly, you can look at some of the engine controls themselves. So it's three APA mandates and two, one related to shale and the shale price. If society has determined that we have enduring values for sustainability and carbon footprint, then the most efficient means of transport wins. Marine has not gonna, done a good job yet of promoting how efficient they are. You can see that truck and rail is far inferior on the ton miles carried compared to inland towing. Coastal will be even better. You can measure in terms of CO2 generated in grams per ton kilometer of cargo carried. Airplanes the worst. We all flew here. Trucks, not good, but obviously cargo vessels are the best. So if that is an important part of society's need to endure the sustainability and carbon footprint being minimized, then Marine will begin to nibble away at trucking and rail and has an assured place in our logistics chain that's likely to expand. What about the emissions? The right-hand side there you can see for an engine of, on diesel fuel, various emissions on CO2, NOx, SOx, and particulates. And on the colors you can see on gas, CO2, a 25% reduction. NOx, an 85% reduction. SOx, virtually eliminated, same with particulates. So in comparison to a gas engine is much better on emissions across the board than any diesel engine is. And why is it so clean on combustion? Because it's basic chemistry. Methane gas has only one carbon molecule and it has four hydrogen high energy molecules. That's the best ratio of any fuel out there. Other fuels such as gasoline have a chain of several different molecules going together in which the ratio of hydrogen is two and a quarter to every carbon. So much more carbon will be produced in the combustion at the point of simple co chemistry and as a basic fact. That's why gas is so very clean and low on CO2. Fuel prices. MGO is in orange, green diesel. Natural gas, you can see by eye, the difference is approaching 40%, but there's a huge benefit there that's likely to give a big pocketbook incentive towards moving towards natural gas, in addition to its emissions cleanliness story. But how? How are vessels today running on natural gas? How many, and is it proven, is it real? Yes, it is. Right now, you can get a complete gas package from what's still including the point one, the point of introduction at the fueling station, the storage tanks, part three, we call an evaporator to allow the gas to vaporize on its way to the engines, from our engines to the propellers, either by a mechanical or electrical drive, and then the smaller engines, the sixes, the gen sets. The entire package from one source, or it's still, so it's all matched without risk of various suppliers coming into to play. Currently, we have over 230 of the larger 50 DF engines in operation on 62 of the large gas carriers. In addition, we have several plants ashore, including in Southern California, where you would have the litmus test of meeting the most rigorous emission standards. 31 installations worldwide, over 100 additional engines. More recently, several vessels in the smaller coastal series classes have also been adopting the smaller gas engines as well. The point is, almost 2 million operating hours it's proven it's real. Over $30 billion has been invested in these ships and some of these plants. Real money working well over the last several years. How long? 
Here's a small vessel. Simple truck, pulls up to the dock, fuels her, and she goes off for another 10 days and comes back. Another simple cycle fueling with a truck. It's simple, it's fast, very direct. This is in Norway for the Viking Energy. What will happen in the near future? As the volumes in gas move up, people will then have a gas feeder, much like the bunker barges of today, taking out of the pipeline of terminal and coming out to all the different types of vessels who could very likely adopt gas soon. Ferries, roll-on, roll-offs, perhaps crews, small coasters and tugs. But th that domestic supply of gas that we have will soon come out in a much more complete logistics supply chain. How long has Wood still been in gas? Well, since 1987 with our first gas diesel. And progressively since then, spark gas as well as dual fuel engines. The dual fuel engine you saw in the large ocean carry started just before 1998. We now have the 34 and the 20 fuel engines as well on, diesel, on gas. So we now have a grandfather, a father, and a grandson all focusing after that geographic area of the ECA. Some conclusions about gas. Those five drivers, three EPA mandates, two because of the availability and cleanliness and low price of gas. But if you look at it, what can you do if you choose otherwise? You can go to these different primary engine or emissions, secondary, which are scrubbers, SCRs, or switch to gas. More stars is better. It's quite obvious from the simple overview that the more stars are always in the gas column for NOx, SOx, PM, and smoke. It looks quite good in comparison to any other means. So I think what you'll find is if you stay with a traditional reciprocating liquid fuel engine, you'll have to have baggage on after treatment or scrubbers. If you switch to gas, you can do away with all that and probably have a savings in the economic side as well. Thank you very much. The next presentation we'll be having today will be at uh, noon. It'll be on uh, selective catalytic NOx reduction, and at 1 o'clock, we'll have one on scrubbers. Each presentation lasts about 12, 15 minutes. Have any questions today? Question. The question was, is what still working with shore side sources to deliver LNG. Yes, we are. And there are four companies well known in Houston who wish to meet more than marine customers to supply them with gas. And you referenced the coastal energy, but what about the line? Those who will go first toward gas are the ones that spend the, the majority of their time within the ECA because of the economic impact of the low sulfur and the high cost and the lack of availability. The more you go offshore, the more the tendency would be to perhaps not first adopt gas, but adopt an alternative such as a scrubber. You also the dual fuel yes. So, and what is the On our dual fuel gas engines, 99% of the energy is from the natural gas, less than 1% is from a small pilot diesel. Now, when the engine moves to liquid fuel mode, an injector takes over and the gas is cut off. Now it's in liquid fuel mode with a small pilot just keeping it clean, but it's mostly diesel. And now that can migrate to heavy fuel as well. So it's really a tri-fuel engine, but it's been branded as a dual fuel engine. The transition from gas mode to diesel mode is instantaneous with no interruption in power. Or a transition into heavy fuel as you have to warm the lines to get the fuel viscosity right. As you go from distillate back to gas, this transition is slower because that's to introduce the gas into the system. But again, it doesn't see a, a dip in power or speed, but it just takes longer period of time. But gas, the other way, is basically instantaneous. It's basically 99% gas engine. Right. On space considerations, in terms of the energy content of fuel, if you said that diesel or heavy fuel was a unit of one, the same thermodynamic mass energy basis would be 1.7 for gas as LNG. However, that's just the theory of the fuel. 
Fuel, as we know, is 98% full in a tank, so you basically wrap it with some steel and it's done. LNG, I now have to put in a cryogenic container, a, a thermos bottle, if you may, and then provide a containment. So now you go to 3.8 times the size for the same equivalent energy. So therefore, what you'll see is that within an ECA, your time there is where you would maybe wish to employ natural gas. As you go outside of an ECA, you'll want to switch back to a international qualified fuel to get your range again. So that's where we'll see the, the trade-off occur, because is more space consuming? Right. If, if the question was, if you use it within the ECA, the quantity is fairly small and compact. Correct. And then when you get outside the ECA, you go to your international fuel for range, as long as it's all, you know, of course, compliant. But that's where we see gas playing a part, particularly with these vessels that come in and out of the ECA. The more you stay in the ECA, of course, the shorter duration between ports, the more frequent you come back and forth, you can maybe convert all to gas. You can always come back to the fuel option. They're almost always within the 200-mile ECA. And here's what we want to point out. That ECA comes in force August 1, 2012. And that ECA will soon be expanded to include the U.S. protectorates, because frankly, the EPA may have forgotten to do that. And they're going to include Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. That application is in process. It's anticipated late 2013 or 14. It will also come into force. So the ECAs are beginning to expand. Not only the U.S., but you're going to find Japan, uh, the Mediterranean, other sensitive places as well, soon becoming ECAs. There'll be many, many more. Yeah. It all depends on, the question is, what's the cost of conversion? First, we hope and pray you have a 46-word SOA engine, as 70% of the cruise industry has. Then you, you take off the components that are not gas-related, it's the parent of our 50 gas engine, and migrate the 50 gas parts on board. We have a vessel now that's undergoing that exact transition, the Tarvit, which is a product carrier. She was built in 2007 with 46 gas, uh, uh, non-natural gas engines with the 46 engine from Wurtzilla. She will begin migrating the heavy fuel parts off and the new gas parts on. It will be done in only a matter of a few weeks. The vessel is destined to go into service May 2011. The decision was reached in September last fall. So they're going to take her out of service, I think, for a month and a half, and she'll go right back into service. So there you have you know, a product carrier, morph it to something else, 46 Wurzel engine, now 50 DF. Fairly modest transformation. If you've got a completely different engine, now it's a different problem. Yesterday, we had Viking Line's president here, and he announced that the new Viking Line ferry, which almost looks like a cruise ship because there's a lot of cabins and a lot of passengers, is going to go all natural gas with the 50 DF engines from Wartzilla. She's entering into service in 2000, I believe, 13 late in the year. Mr. Bachman was here. Yeah, it's a very important order. It's a demonstrating it's getting closer and closer to a real cruise ship. Thank you for the question. Are there any more questions? OK. <laughs> Anyone else have a question today? We'll have another presentation soon. And each one runs 12, 15 minutes. Look forward to hearing more questions in the near future. Thank you for coming. Yeah.